Praise thee the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We pray that you would just be with us as we come together to praise you and worship you one more time. We ask you would meet us here, that the focus would truly be on you. We know that we can't do this without you, so we want to have this experience to commune with you as one body of believers. We also thank you for this amazing organization you've created known as The Church, so that we don't have to walk through this world alone. And we pray that we would, would truly be what you would have us to be in terms of the community that you've created, that we will act as your body in this world, bringing about the changes that you desire to see fit. So help us to stand in line and be what it is that you have called us to be. And we thank you again for the technology that makes it possible for us to come together and the knowledge that you are with us wherever we are, not just those of us who are in this building, but those who are in our cars, in our homes, outside enjoying the crisp fall weather or outside enjoying warm weather, wherever we are. We just thank you that you are wherever we are and you care about us and you love us. So we pray you would meet us here and have your way in this service. These things we ask in your son Jesus name. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service today. Sorry, I'm still adjusting things but it's good to see you all this morning i made a point of putting my name up for those who don't know um but we are glad to have you here on this the second sunday of december it's hard to believe that we are almost done with the year 2023 um it is also the second sunday in advent so today we are lighting the candle of peace um which we're going to talk about later on you know you see the advent wreath right here in front Last week, we lit this candle, which was hope. This week is peace. So I am thankful to be here with you all today. I'm spending time with you all during this service. Let me turn the comments on so I can see what people are saying. All right, we had some brief technical difficulties that, you know, delayed things a little bit. But, you know, God is faithful and God is helping me to figure out how to fix these things on the fly. So I am glad to be here today and to see you all. Good morning, Mom Rhonda. Good morning, Mom Deaconess Julia. And good morning, Sylvia. I'm glad to see you all. Um, but yeah, it's another Sunday that God has kept us, and we are thankful for that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk more about Advent later, um, as well as give some more announcements. But it has been quite a week, but I'm glad that, again, God has kept us. God has been faithful. And I know I can't be the only one that's had a bit of a challenging week, but I am just glad to be here one more time and glad to see you all one more time. So um, I'm going to do what I do every um, Sunday, which is, of course, to welcome those of you who this is your first time worshiping with us. Um, we encourage you to fill out a contact card. That way we um, can keep up with you. But we formally welcome you, formally welcome you to Pivot Point Gathering. Um, and we would love to be in touch with you. So feel free to fill out a contact card. You can also put your prayer request in the contact card. That is how um, we tell people where we are. Not how we tell people where we are. That's how we keep up with you. The contact card, the point of the contact card is for us to keep up with you and to hear from you about the things that you need and how we can better serve you as this community. So no, the thing that's how we tell people where we are is what I'm about to do next, which is the encouragement to share. I have already shared today's service, of course, you know, but, you know, sharing what we do here is pretty much the equivalent of what used to be, you know, word of mouth. It's a personal recommendation because now the way things are in this world, um, especially as a result of the pandemic, most churches are streaming now, right? So th the fact that we stream isn't enough to set us apart. But if you believe in what we do here, we encourage you to share. And we also want to make sure those of you who are here today, well, or if it's somebody who's here new, we want to make sure that people know how to find us. Um, so you can find us at, on Facebook. Presumably, if you're watching live right now or later, you know that you can find us on Facebook or YouTube as Pivot Point Gathering. You can also find us on Instagram and 
well, X, formerly known as Twitter, and TikTok is underscore pivot underscore point. Though in full transclosure, we don't really use our X account. Um, but, you know, you can find us on Instagram and on TikTok. And you can check us out on our website at pivotpoint.church. And we want to make sure, you know, don't just follow, don't just like, but don't just subscribe, but also comment and share because those things make us have a more engaged following. And the more engaged our following is, the further the social media algorithms push our information out there. But not to worry, we also are taking some steps so that we aren't fully at the mercy of the social media algorithm for how many people find us. So we have some things behind the scenes we're working on so that we can stream to our own website. That way we can reach some people who maybe don't like Facebook, aren't comfortable with YouTube, and want to see us live. But we're working on that. In the meantime, if you feel so led, as I've said, share, like, comment, subscribe. Whatever you do helps us get the message out a little further. And if you're not the kind of person that does those sorts of things, it's all right. I'm typically not either. And we love you. We're glad you're here. And we pray you get something out of today's service. So with that, and I see you. Good morning, Vicky. With that, um, we are going to go into our song for today because this is a Sunday about peace. We're singing a very simple song about peace. And the words are simply, you are my peace. You are my peace. You are my peace. And I worship thee. All right. And we are singing that song because, again, today is the Sunday that we focus on peace, which is the second Sunday in Advent. And for some of you who may be wondering, where are the Christmas songs? Don't worry. We are going to have a Christmas Eve service where we sing some official Christmas songs. So don't worry. That's going to happen. And honestly, a Christmas song or two may make an appearance between now and Christmas Eve. All right? But we're going to go on to our song right now. A reminder that God is our peace. And again, sometimes we need to have these simple songs because life can be complicated, but... When life is complicated, it's good to remember those simple truths that God is our peace. You know, God is our peace. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, God is with us and God is our peace. All right.
just then so it's good to see you all and that's one of those songs that it's much easier to sing in a group because it's pretty repetitive and so usually the person who's leading can ad lib over it but you know we make it work and that's a song I look forward to singing when we all get together um, in one place and the blessing is that we have some events that are coming up where we will be getting together soon um but right now, I'm going to ask you all, I'm going to put my name back up for those who just joined us. Um, we are going to continue to be in prayer for those in our community who are sick. Um, special prayers for Uncle William, who usually would be watching, but is still, um, you know, in the hospital. So we'll be praying for him and, you know, visiting him and keeping up with him. And so, but just know, I mean, especially at this time of year of the holidays, it's a hard time for anybody who's sick in, in the hospital to be away from their loved ones. So a special prayer for him while he's there recovering and recuperating and a special prayer for all those who are helping to take care of him and supporting him while he's there. Um, so now I'm going to go into our announcements and our announcements are always, we start with the things we are praying for right now. So what are we praying for right now? Our location, you know, We've been streaming for a while, but we do believe that God wants us to open up a physical location so we can reach people who are on the other side of the digital divide or uncomfortable with social media. So we also, in addition to, one, to praying about where the lo location will be, we also need to be in prayer about what type of building, you know, a type of building that makes it possible for us to do all that God has called us to. And that is a part of our prayers for, for our capacity as well. The ability to be what it is that God has called us to be, you know, not just about money, but other kinds of resources, people, focus, wherewithal, you know, things like that. We want to be everything God called us to be. So we need to be praying that our capacity is there. We want to continue to pray about the violence that's happening in our streets, you know, every day, another shooting, um, every day, another stabbing. So many things have been happening and it's pretty sad that in some ways we as a nation have become callous toward this. Um, we want to continue to pray for the health of our community. Many of our members deal with chronic illnesses and we want to continue to be in prayer for um, just their healing. And, uh, and we want to be in prayer about the issues that we as people of color face with the medical establishment in general. And while we talk about the health of our community, let's not forget those who are supporting loved ones who are sick because you know that can take a lot out of you as well um we want to continue to pray about our nation's infrastructure we want to stand in solidarity with our bereaved families you know um whether your loved one has been dead for a few hours or a few decades the pain is still there and you know grief is sneaky sometimes you're over it sometimes you just have a vivid memory of that person that makes you wish they were there so we're here with you standing with you with that we also want to continue to be in prayer about our political system because, yeah, things are bleak, especially as we look um, moving forward to the next presidential election and realizing who the Republican candidate may be, which means that there still is a very real possibility that we can have another 
four years of Trump, you know. So we want to be in prayer about that because there's no way that somebody facing so many convictions and all should even be eligible. But, you know, that's another story. And we want to also continue to be in prayer about what's happening in Israel and the lives that are being lost and the fact that a conversation as simple as a ceasefire is becoming polarizing. So let's be in prayer about that as well. Okay. So now um, our next slide, let me take a sip of this tea because I really need it today. Our next slide, we are um, still working on um, our Bible study and prayer line. Obviously, you know, with the things happening between Uncle William being sick and my father, who's still sick and in need of more, you know, monitoring. I haven't really had the time to get back to the Bible study and prayer line, but I can assure you we are working on it. And this is the last week we'll be talking about this because my 40th birthday celebration is on Saturday. So I hope to see you all there. Again, don't let finances be the reason that you can't come. We've had some tickets donated, so feel free to reach out to me if you would like to be there and you're concerned about the finances, all right? Um, but yeah, I hope to see you all there. It's going to be quite a celebration. I mean, I figured I wanted to celebrate my birthday with people who were closest to me, and you all, the church, are among the people who are closest to me. So it's going to be quite a time, you know, good food, good fellowship. We don't get a chance to see each other very much, so... I really wanted it to be a chance for us to fellowship and spend time together. All right. So I hope to see you there. And with that, before we move on to our, um, to our service, to our sermon, there are a few things I want to do. Some housekeeping things. Reminder, if this is your first time here with us, fill out a contact card. You can also submit your prayer requests through there or through our Instagram and Facebook stories. You know, we do pray for those prayer requests during the week. We've had some prayer requests that have actually been submitted. You know, people direct messaging me on the side asking for prayer, and I appreciate that. Also, let us know if God or how God has been answering your prayers, you know, because, yes, we pray every week. We believe in the power of prayer, but it also strengthens our belief in the power of prayer when we hear how God is answering the prayers that we have lifted up. All right. Um, Also, if you'd like to make a donation to this ministry, we would appreciate it. Um, your money would go toward our future community events, um, like my birthday event, but also other things we're doing. Like we are, for instance, buying Christmas gifts for five needy children, five needy local children. Um, so your money is going toward that. It would go toward um, the update of our equipment. Um, and it would go toward the times that I'm not here when somebody covers for me. I currently don't take a um, salary or a stipend from the church because I would like to see the money go toward us growing more and doing more of what it is God has called us to. All right. And lastly, if you'd like some more information about what we do, check out our website. Okay. But now, because it is Advent, we are going to light this second candle before I move on to the sermon, all right? Just a minute. You would think I would have put this up already, but I do have um, my Advent readings bookmarked. So we are now at the second Sunday of Advent for the reading. So I'm going to get the candle ready. And some of you, if you're pretty astute, yes, you see it. There is a lighter. And I don't, you know, smoke, obviously. So that is why there's a lighter here. Okay, 
Today we light the candle of hope. Now we light the second candle, the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. From the prophet Isaiah, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. And now from the Gospel of John, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled do, and do not let them be afraid. That is John fourteen twenty seven. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and the countries of our world. Please let us see the paths of peace in our lives. Then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you are only, you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. All right. So that is our Advent service. Um, at, you know, our recognition of Advent, for those of you who need some background, Advent, you know, we, along with millions of other Christians around the world, um, are celebrating this season that commemorates the coming of Jesus as well as his eventual return. So Advent is exactly four Sundays out from Christmas. And this year, the four Sundays of Advent happen to correspond with, um, well, the first four Sundays in December. So we have December 2nd, I mean, no, December 3rd, then December 10th, next week's December 17th, and then the last Sunday of Advent is Christmas Eve. So yes, we will be doing double duty on Christmas Eve because Advent services also come with a Christmas Eve service, you know, where we commemorate the arrival of Jesus, all right? So yes, we will have our regular Sunday service, and then we will also later in the day have a small Christmas Eve service where we get a chance to sing some great Christmas carols, all right? So that is what's happening, and you all, you're welcome to have your own Advent wreaths at your home. I know some people light the Advent candles every night of Advent. We're only going to do it four times, you know, one for each Sunday. But it's important to me that we do our part to focus on a truly, like, holy time of this season and not just get caught up in the commercialism. It's very easy to do that, <laughs> but I figured... If our society is at a point where we can start decorating for Christmas the day after Halloween, you know, we as believers have the right to like embrace a season that we also celebrate starting immediately after Thanksgiving. All right. So that is where we are. Now we're going to move on to our message for today. So if you can open your Bibles to um, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. When you have it, feel free to type through an amen, and I'm going to put this up on the screen right now so you can see it. And I'm going to get some more tea because I really need it. And in case you're wondering, yes, the man in that picture is the Apostle Peter. And that is because this letter is largely attributed to the Apostle Peter, though we are going to talk a bit more about that like we always do. And I see the amen that came through. Thanks, Mom Rhonda. I can always rely on you to type through an amen at this time. So I know you all are here. So we are going to move on. I'm going to take myself off the screen for a little bit. And it reads thus for the New American Standard Bible because that's just our preference. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? 
looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So today, if we are taking notes, the title of this message is this, the challenging pursuit of peace. That is the challenging pursuit of peace. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We pray that you would just be with us as we come to this preaching moment. Have your way. Use me as a vessel to speak to these, your people, to give us a word that will help us to be better representatives of you, where you have placed us as we apply your teachings to our lives. And we just thank you for allowing us the privilege to come together once again. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So, the challenging pursuit of peace. So today is the second Sunday in Advent, as we said. And so we just finished lighting the second candle, which was the candle of peace. Um, and what struck me, because during Advent, this is also the one time in a year that I tend to follow the lectionary. And so those of you who don't know what a lectionary is, a lectionary is essentially a schedule that many churches follow where there are suggested readings um, based on what is happening according to the Christian calendar. So in general, you think, let's think Catholic churches, Episcopal churches, Methodist churches, many Presbyterian churches, they read particular passages of the Bible at particular times of the year. And so if you are a minister or somebody who preaches in those types of churches, you know that your sermon is expected to come out of those passages at that time. And since we are in the season of Advent, um, the lectionary has suggested passages for each of the four Sundays in Advent. And so I like to challenge myself to preach from the lectionary for these um, four Sundays. And sometimes I do it at other points in the year, too. Like I may continue on to the next season, which is called Epiphany, which is, well, actually, not, we're going to talk about, well, yeah, Epiphany is when... I'll get into liturgical seasons later um, without getting into a lot of details. I don't want to be sidetracked, but I may continue because the, the next season after um, Christmas is over is when the three kings arrive and they um, acknowledge the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. And I believe that does correspond with the season of Epiphany. Let me just make sure I'm right about that. Yep, liturgical, yep, liturgical epiphany is a season that immediately follows Christmas time. So during that particular season, that's when we talk about the arrival of the three kings. So yeah, I may preach about the three kings in early January when the season of epiphany is among us, but um, generally I don't preach out a lectionary. Long way of getting a little bit sidetracked. But so when I talked about it, that's why I didn't mention, you know, me praying and looking for a passage of scripture to come to, because last week, this week, and the next two weeks, I'm praying about which passage to preach from that's in the lectionary. But as I read the passage for today, um, it was a very helpful reminder for me. And what struck me most about it was that even though we believe that the return of Jesus, which is also symbolized by the end of the world, as this passage so eloquently demonstrated, but that as we anticipate the return of Jesus, um, we are supposed to be active. And particularly at the end of the world, as the author of this passage talks about, we want God to find us in peace. And it's helpful because sometimes we as believers can get so caught up in the promise of an afterlife in the presence of God that we forget about what God wants for us here. And if you've been following this ministry for a while, you know that I feel 
a pretty strong burden to make sure that I express that our faith is not just good for ensuring us a particular kind of afterlife, but our faith is meant to call us to action now. And that is why I tend to come back to Luke 4, 18 every Sunday, because it reminds us that, yes, Jesus is our Messiah. Yes, Jesus came to deliver us from eternal damnation. But yes, Jesus also came to call out structures of oppression that were happening even in his society at the time. And that as we share the gospel, as we spread the good news of Jesus Christ, even in this time, there is more to the good news than freedom from hell and life in heaven, well, afterlife in heaven. We are also supposed to do our part to create the world that Jesus described here. You know, like I said, to root out the oppression, to bring sight to the blind, to set the captive free, you know, to take care of the orphan and the widow. All those things that Jesus talked about, not just in um, Luke 4, 18, but throughout his ministry. Those are all things that we are meant to do, and they are not just limited to telling people, oh, you know, the minute you believe in Jesus, you're freed from hell. So um, I like passages like this because they remind us that we have work to do even while we are here. Um, and... So what does it mean exactly, though, when Jesus says that he, sorry, what does it mean exactly when the Apostle Peter, the author, um, which we're going to get to in a second, says that, um, you know, we need, we want to be found by God in peace? Well, peace itself was important to Jesus. I mean, we know even in the Beatitudes, particularly in Matthew 4, 9, Jesus says, I mean, Matthew 5, 9, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they should be called sons of God. So we know that it is important enough that being identified as a child of God, you know, also suggests that we are making peace with all those around us. But what I believe is also getting at is the fact that as humans, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, our lives are full of divisions that are often the source of conflicts. And for those of us who identify as believers or those of us who hope to identify as believers, our process of mediating and resolving these conflicts is important because we are called to be peacemakers. That's what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. But if we're honest about this, as believers, as Christians at large, conflict resolution isn't exactly our strong point. You know, as Christians, we have a reputation for being mean and judgmental. And it's something I talk about a lot. And it's not just, you know, people have that, bad experience that we've all talked about about you know going into a church and sitting in an open seat only to have a stern usual church usually a stern church mother come up to you and say that's my seat you know hey you're a visitor you had no way of knowing that but i'm not even just talking about those kind of micro level interactions i'm talking about the way that as believers some of our evangelical brothers and sisters do things politically that make them come across as harsh, mean, and judgmental. So as I said, you know, conflict resolution isn't seen as our strong point. Um, Plus, the reason that we have so many denominations under the umbrella of the Christian church at large is the existence of unresolved disagreements. Sometimes these are theological conflicts and sometimes they are far more petty than that. And truth be told, The reason that we have so many churches is also the existence of unresolved disagreements. And that is true, even if we don't want to admit it, that sometimes you can read the history of a church and find out that it really originated as a split from another congregation and not because of something related to scripture or theology, but because some people just didn't get along. You know, it's sad, but it's true. And it's often the case. Now, this is not my way of saying that all churches that start, you know, are the result of unresolved conflicts. I mean, for instance, you know that we launched out of Your Will Christian Ministries, the church that I pastored for a few years, the church that I helped my cousin launch. But 
our launch was not really the result of any sort of conflict. It just was God putting it on my heart for us to go in a different direction than where we had been going as Your Will Christian Ministries. And even if you go back to the history of Your Will Christian Ministries, when we came out of Star of Hope Baptist Church, that was the result of our then, you know, of our founder and then pastor, um, Reverend George Nelson, and what God had put on his heart to reach a different population than what Star of Hope was reaching. And even if you go back one more generation in the church in terms of the establishment of Star of Hope, you find that Star of Hope was created um, as a church for the recent migrants who arrived to the Philadelphia area from Virginia to have their own place where they could worship because they were largely a group of black people living in a mostly white community. And you know, even if it wasn't under the law of segregation, you know, cities in the early 1900s were still pretty segregated. And so they needed their own place to worship. So what I'm saying is that there are a lot of churches out there that were started for the right reasons, but there also are a lot of churches out there that were started because of conflicts that people didn't try to resolve. Um, but we need to make sure that as the body of Christ, we are promoting peace wherever we go. And like I said, not our strong point, but one of the things we are called to. So in a time that we have available today, um, we're going to talk about three ideas that can make the pursuit of peace challenging. But before we get to those three ideas, let's talk about some context, because I like context. So as I said, today's passage comes from the second epistle of Peter, and this epistle, this epistle or letter, as we call it, is largely attributed to the Apostle Peter, you know, the hothead that followed Jesus around. Um, he was one of the 12 disciples, um, you know, the rock upon whom Jesus said he was building the church, you know, all these things. That's who Peter was. But the reason that I've been very careful, well, I'm not as careful as I could have been, but the reason that I've been careful to say the author and the Apostle Peter, you know, as I talk about this passage, is that as with most of the other epistles, the um, authorship of this one is um, not quite clear. Because even though we do historically believe that this was written by the Apostle Peter toward the end of his life, there also are a lot of scholars who believe that this was actually written by a student or some students who were familiar with the Apostle Peter's work. But because of some of the language that's used in this book, they believe that it could have been written after the Apostle Peter's death. So, you know, it's not clear cut. Um, it doesn't really have any bearing on how I'm talking about today's passage, but I'm going to try to be careful to say the author instead of the Apostle Peter because the authorship is not clear. But if you believe the Apostle Peter wrote it, it's fine. There, It's not clear cut either way. I just feel like I had to let you all know these things because, as I've said before, I've heard some stories of people walking away from their Christian faith because nobody ever told them basic things like the authorship of certain books of the Bible is not clear cut. So I'm going to make sure you all know that from the beginning. All right. But as we get to um, the third chapter of the second epistle, um, we are toward the end of it. Like the chapter, the, th the second epistle only has three chapters and it only has 18 verses. So today's passage picks up at verse 10, verse 10 out of 18, as the author is ending this letter. And the author chooses to end this letter with a reminder of the way that believers are to, con are to conduct themselves as they wait for the return of Jesus. And again, it's pretty... Um, straightforward in how it talks about, you know, there is going to come a time when the current heaven and earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and earth that we're looking toward um, in which, as the passage says, righteousness dwells. So that's what we would think of as the end of the world, but that there will be another place that God has set aside for those who believe in him. Um, but what's great about this passage is it reminds us like, well, don't just sit aside and look 
for that time period to come up, you need to make sure that when Jesus does come back, you are found by him in peace. So that means we are to be pursuing peace with those who are around us. That means it is not just waiting, it is active waiting. It is working while we wait, making the world a better place while we wait for Jesus to come back. So now we're going to talk about the three issues that I brought up earlier, the three things that I have seen and I've been praying about that make the pursuit of peace difficult. All right. And this makes sense because this message is called the challenging pursuit of peace. So point number one is this. We must pursue peace with those who do not look like us. We must pursue peace with those who do not look like us. And if you're looking at this slide and thinking, wow, this seems like it's the ugly duckling, you are correct. You see, there are the four yellow ducklings and they are looking at this other one. It just doesn't seem like them and they kind of make fun of him. And I feel like it's also apt that we remember that the ugly duckling wasn't really an ugly duckling. By the end of the story, we find out that the ugly duckling was actually a swan, you know, beautiful in his own right. He just was in an environment where he was misunderstood. And I think that's helpful for us to understand um, that sometimes the people who look different from us, you know, have perspectives and have, you know, unique vantage points that can make them an asset to our communities if we actually take the time to get to know them instead of judging them based on their appearance. Now, although this point about those who do not look like us, this would be a very easy time for me to talk about racism because, you know, I talk a lot about racism in this church. Um, especially since we know racism itself is really based on physical characteristics. It was one group of people justifying the poor treatment and subjugation of another group of people based solely on their physical characteristics. Um, so yes, that is a great example of this, but there are other things that come up when we judge, you know, based on how people look as well. And I'm going to focus on something that's a bit less obvious, though not any less relevant. And that is classism. All right? Classism. Because see, as much as we don't like to admit it, there are plenty of physical markers of class that we use to discriminate against one another. Let's talk about clothing, for instance, you know? And no, I'm not talking about designer labels or expensive clothing like that. No, I'm talking about the way that people believe that outfit types signify a particular socioeconomic status, you know? And as a result, a black man wearing a fitted cap and some jeans and some Jordans, however expensive the jeans and Jordans may be, probably won't be treated with the same respect as a black man wearing a polo shirt, khakis, and some nice Oxford shoes, or even a black man wearing a suit, tie, and dress shoes. And the reason I made all three people in this comparison black is you know, we're leaving out the issues of racism and just pointing out that even though we've all been taught don't judge a book by its cover, we are pretty quick to judge a book by its cover. And like I said, this is not even limited to clothing. I mean, one thing that I have noticed that doesn't really make sense in our um, system is that, you know, we have a lot of issues that I talk about all the time related to healthcare, but yet there are certain things that are key to healthcare that for every reason our society sees as luxuries. And one of those things is dental care. I mean, let's face it, you know, people who are wealthier have clear access to dental care. People who are not, you know, a lot of times dental care is seen as an optional add-on to our health care, if you will. Never mind the fact that, you know, we need our teeth to eat and that we as people really do judge those who don't have perfect smiles. And I'm not even talking about, it's one thing when somebody smiles and they have a mouthful of crooked teeth, but it's another thing when somebody smiles and their teeth are missing, period. You know, we, we judge people based on that. Um, 
in one of my days, like within the past few weeks, you know, I was scrolling and watching something on some of you know the MTV show Catfish, where it follows people who have maybe been in relationships with people that they have never seen. Like they either talk online in chat rooms or they talk on the phone, but something has always gone wrong when it's time to meet. And so the belief is that usually these people are, you know, using somebody else's picture that's fake, you know, so that you wouldn't actually get a chance to know who this person really is. Like a lot of times if you watch Catfish, you find that it's somebody who feels bad about themselves, who's using someone else's photo to have, you know, emotional connections with others. But then when it comes time to meet, they're afraid that, once the person they've been communicating with sees what they really look like, that they'll want to cut it off. Well, recently I've seen two different episodes where you find that the people were actually talking to who they thought they were talking to, you know, but that the reason that the meetings didn't happen in both cases was that the person or the people had issues with their smiles. One man was missing several teeth. The other woman had a chipped tooth. And so in both cases, they were afraid to meet in person or even FaceTime because of the fact that they would be judged by their teeth. So I'm bringing this one up because whether we like to admit it or not, a lot of us really do judge people by their smiles. And we understand that in this society, having a beautiful smile is often a proxy for wealth because it means that you had access to quality dental care or you had access to quality, you know, restorative treatments. You know, you lost teeth, you were able to get dental implants. You chipped your teeth, you were able to get veneers. Or even you had crooked teeth and you were able to get braces, which I did have braces, so people get on me for not smiling. But the point is, That is a marker of class, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Not everybody can afford braces. Not everybody can afford to go to the dentist. Not everybody can afford to make sure their teeth are healthy. And our society doesn't make it easy for that to happen. And even though we've been talking about things that are markers of appearance, um, I'm going to extend this to another way that we step forward into the world, which is our sound. Because Classism is also classism is also the reason that people are ashamed of their accents. And no, I'm not just talking about people who speak English as a second language and you know have foreign accents. No, I'm talking about people with particular regional accents that have been deemed as low class, paying or hoping to pay speech therapists to help mask those accents for them. You know, and this is not just people in Hollywood. We've heard cases of people like, most notably, Fran Drescher, who talked about the pressure to get rid of her Queen's accent before it ironically became the key to her success in The Nanny. You know, or people in the corporate world, or people in academia who are concerned that no one will take them seriously if they still sound like somebody from their region. And this is something that even First Lady and I have talked about, that You know, let's face it, the Philadelphia area has a pretty distinct accent, but the accent also differs depending on your race. And that there are some of us who have been concerned that, you know, maybe the way I talk or the way I speak is an obstacle to me being taken seriously. You know, it's not a matter of me speaking in a bonnet, although I will say that as people of color, as black people, we have a right to have our own language and our own dialect just like everybody else does and we're the only ones that have been shamed for it but there are some of us who still you know we can speak in and out of abonics as we need to and are still concerned about the way our speech comes across the way our speech patterns are just because of the negative associations that come with our regional accents all right But the reason this is important, you know, so I've just talked about how people are judged by their appearance or even their sound, you know, we have to be careful about this because we are commanded by the Great Commission to teach all nations, not that just those who look like us, not just those who dress in ways that we would find respectable, 
not just those who even sound how we think someone respectable would sound using the correct words and the correct dialect, you know. We are called to preach to all nations, you know, when everybody is not going to look like us. Everybody is not going to come across the way we do. And I know social, social psychology makes it clear. We like people who are similar to us. But guess what? We are not always going to be able to minister to people who look just like us, who function just like we function in the world. And we have to be okay with that because, you know, we can't live up to our mandate to preach and teach to all nations if we're not at peace with those people, all right? So, and that brings me to my second point, which is this. Not only do we must we pursue peace with people who do not look like us, we must pursue peace with those who do not act like us. You know, and what do I mean by that? Well, you see in this particular um, picture, it looks like, you know, this is taking place at a workplace and it looks like there are two co-workers who can't get along with each other and one person who's in the middle um, preventing things from getting out of hand, right? But what is a major source of conflict, you know, when it comes to people? Well, differences in personality, differences in the way we act. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that I believe that this is one of the major reasons that the church and the black church in particular has lost its influence. We are quick to look down on people who do not act like we do. You know, and it's true. In some of our communities, and yes, I'm talking about black communities, um, there is this dichotomy between the churched and the unchurched. People who go to church every Sunday, people who come from families that go to church all the time versus those who don't. And Truth be told, this persists not just in our communities, but also in our families. Because sometimes we forget that as the church, one of our main reasons for existing is to spread the gospel. And as I've said, we are to teach all nations, you know, all peoples, right? We believe that the gospel has the power to transform, but many of us feel like we have the right to pick and choose who gets to benefit from the gospel's transformative power? As if God didn't reveal himself to us when we were in a less than desirable state. And I'm going to say that one more time. We as the church believe that the gospel has the power to transform. But many of us feel that we have the right to pick and choose who gets to benefit from the gospel's transformative power. As if God didn't reveal himself to us when we were in a less than desirable state. See, we don't always have the patience for people who don't understand the nuances of church life. Never mind the fact that many of those nuances are, you know, man-made and have nothing to do with the gospel message itself. And if we're honest, this in and of itself is a reflection of how classism has infiltrated the church. But here's the thing. When we deem people as undesirable and avoid teaching them the gospel, we are keeping them from knowledge that we know can not only change their lives and change the tra trajectories of their families, but based on the beliefs that many of us have, we are also setting them up for afterlives of eternal torment. And I'm going to say that again to make sure we understand it, that when we deem people as undesirable and avoid teaching them the gospel, we are keeping them from knowledge that we know can not only change their lives and change the trajectories of their families, but based on the beliefs that many of us have, we are also setting them up for afterlives of eternal torment. And I know that some of us have universalist leanings, which means that there are some of us who believe that, you know, everybody would um, be saved eventually anyway. But many of us don't have universalist leanings. And for those of us who don't and know that we don't, we have to be careful acting like we have the right to determine who is worthy of receiving the gospel message. And truth be told, one of the reasons that there was space for so many other religions to come into our black communities is that those religious groups did a great job of attending to the needs that we as the church look down upon. You know, for instance, the Nation of Islam, we know, does great work with men in prison 
and with women who lose their partners to inner city violence. You know, whereas a lot of us as church people, if our relatives go to prison, we act like they don't exist anymore. And if, you know, a woman in our community lost their partner to um, inner city violence, sometimes we're not as sympathetic to that as we should be. So that's the point I'm making. The point is that there are people that we as a church have discarded that other groups are like, oh, yeah, come on, you know, we love you and we have something that can benefit you. We have something that can help you. And it's sad because we do believe that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the answer for all the problems that exist in the world today. But yet, if someone doesn't act the way we should, we may decide, uh, you know what, it's not worth it to even try to talk to them. But let's think back. Thankfully, the people that God had come into our lives and tell us the good news, thankfully, they didn't look at us and decide, you know what, he's never going to get it. It's not worth it. You know what, she's a mess. You know what, I can't even be in the same room with that person because they're so messed up. You know, we should be thankful that the people who God chose to come into our lives to help reveal himself to us, we're th- we should be thankful that those people were not judgmental. Those people did not look down on us. That those people did not decide of their own accord that we weren't worth talking to. All right? So we need to watch out for that. Because, again, the Great Commission says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, not just those who act like us. And we can't teach people who we are not at peace with. Again, if you think it's possible, try teaching somebody who knows they don't who knows you don't like them. Try it. Try teaching somebody when there is a conflict, whether spoken or unspoken. That conflict will flavor everything that you say to them and everything that they say to you. And in the end, you won't even really be able to communicate because all you're communicating is going to be through this conflict that's in the way. All right? Which brings me to my final point, and that's this. Not only must we pursue peace with those who do not look like us and pursue peace with those who do not act like us, but we also must pursue peace with those who do not think like us. And for this, yes, I pulled in a popular meme that was going around on social media for some years where you have, in this case... It looks like, you know, two people and one, they're, they're facing a number, right? But from one, the vantage point is a six and the other, the vantage point is a nine. And so they're having an argument about who is right. And the answer that is suggested by this is that they both are right. It's just a matter of their perspective. But what I'm going to add in is that at the same time, for the person on the left, that is definitely a six that they see. And there is something to be said for acknowledging that they see a six. And for the person on the right, that is a nine they see. And there is something to acknowledge that when they talk about it, they're talking about a nine. So what I'm saying is that, yes, it was a matter of vantage point, but we also have to be very careful telling somebody that based on our experience that their perspective of how they view the world and how they think in the world is wrong, okay? And for that, I have some good examples. But because, you know, you would think I was going to focus on religion or politics because those are things we talk about in this church a lot. But today I felt God leading me in a different direction. So we're going to talk about some things that deal with culture in general. Because making peace with people who don't think like us, as I said, requires making room to acknowledge that other perspectives exist, particularly in other countries. See, a lot of us, because we don't travel as much as maybe we could, you know, and again, this is something that has to do with class as well, because you have to have money to be able to travel. But a lot of us, because we don't have the opportunity to travel outside of our country, or actually outside of our neighborhood for a lot of us, um, we don't necessarily have the most global of perspectives. So we just kind of forget the limits to the perspective that we have. And this can cause problems when we run into people from other countries. And so I've got some examples. 
So the first example is one that some of you have probably heard. It's a personal example from me. But I'm going to say it again anyway because it is definitely relevant to um, how challenging it can be sometimes to make peace with those who don't think like us. So years ago, I had a chance to go on a trip with a gospel choir to Brazil. We were going to be singing at an orphanage for Brazilian street kids. You know, homelessness was a major problem in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And so this American man and his family used their money to move down there and start an orphanage or a shelter, essentially, for these kids who were homeless. You know, so they would have a place to stay. You know, they, they would teach them about the Bible and teach them gospel music and things like that. That's what we were coming in to do, to teach them gospel music as well. But fundamentally, the reason we were there was that a lot of these kids were poor. A lot of these kids were runaways. Many of them had been victims of sex trafficking. So it was a pretty heavy trip that we went on, right? But this story comes from before we even got to the trip. So... Um, we had a connector flight that went through Miami and then flew, I guess, about eight to nine hours to Sao Paulo, Brazil. So when we um, got on our flight, you know, as is often the case with international flights, there were people on the flight that did not speak English. They spoke Portuguese because that's the language that Brazilians speak. And although for our trip, we had tried to learn some basic Portuguese, you know, keep in mind, this is a group of largely high school and college students, so there's only so much Portuguese we were going to know at that point. And there were some parents who went on the trip, too. Um, so in trying to communicate to Brazilians on our flight, you know, some people in my group, they put together their own makeshift kind of um, sign language, if you will. You know, you're thinking, well... We don't understand each other's words. And for those who are a little young, this is before the time period where you could go on your phone and use Google Translate, all right? You know, we had to try to figure things out. So um, so we're trying to figure out how to communicate. And, you know, of course, I was fine. But there were others who were at the edge of the group who were trying to communicate with the Brazilians who were sitting near us. And... At some point, it becomes clear that there has been some kind of miscommunication. Like, things get heated. The Brazilians seem like they're really angry and upset, and they're talking about people in our group, but we don't really know what's going on because, like I said, we don't understand Portuguese. But you can kind of tell the body language and the intonation, like, oh, they are angry. Like, they're, like, banging their seats against people's legs, and it, it just is a mess. And they're like, well, how do we present, prevent this from getting out of hand? You know, we're a Christian group. We're trying to go down to Brazil to make a difference. So, you know, I remember pulling some people aside and some of us pulled some people aside in our group. To figure, you know, it's not worth it. We don't know what's going on. Let's just try to deal with the situation. I even kind of think in hindsight, you know, one of the flight attendants got involved, you know, try to mediate the conflict. But we never really understood what happened until we got to Brazil. And somebody said in passing, you know, so what was it? And one of the members of the group said, well, I was trying to tell them was everything okay, and I'd made this symbol, you know, for okay. Because for us in the United States, that means okay. And I don't remember who it was, but someone in our group said, that's the middle finger in Brazil. So you get what happened here? The person in my group or the people in my group, in their attempt to be friendly, they were actually escalating the situation because their sign for everything is A-OK -okay meant, you know, the equivalent of our middle finger. So inadvertently, they didn't realize that they had started the situation by using a sign that was offensive to the people that they were trying to be nice to. And in a lot of ways, you can think this is being loud and wrong by assuming that American gestures are universally accepted and understood worldwide. In this case, they were not. And although I know it sounds crazy, it happens a lot. We do have the potential to be loud and wrong, even with the best of intentions. Case in point, recently there was some confusion about the racial identity of South African singer Tyla best known for her very popular song, Water. So in some interviews, when people would ask her how she identified, she said she did not identify as black. Now, 
that confused people because if you look at her in this country, people who look like her are considered black. You know, she could walk right into a black neighborhood and fit right in. But she said she identifies as colored, colored being spelled with a U. So, of course, C-O-L-O-U-R-E-D. So there were some black Americans who were offended when she said this, you know, people getting on their TikToks and saying, you know, colored is what they called us when they were trying to put us down way back when. We're not colored anymore. We're black. You know, people saying things like that. But here's the thing. In South Africa, being colored, you know, especially in this generation, was not considered a slur. See, in this country, in the United States, anybody who had even one traceable black, sorry, anybody who even had one traceable drop of black blood was considered black. So it didn't matter how you looked. It was all based on your lineage. And we had a binary. You were either black or you were white. Well, that is not how things worked in apartheid um, South Africa. So they had people who were white and they had people who were black, who were Africans, but they also created a third category for people who, you know, were visibly mixed. People who maybe knew they had some white blood and knew they had some black blood and maybe some other indigenous blood as well, you know, since there are some Indian populations that you know, moved to that area because you had to think that South Africa was a British colony and India was a British colony. So, you know, when I talk about India, I'm talking about like actual Indians from India who moved there. So there was a mixture of people that took place. But what's interesting about those who were considered colored in South Africa is that it wasn't always based on your lineage. There would be people in the same families and one sibling might be considered black because of their skin tone, and another sibling would still be considered colored because of their skin tone. So, Tyla is a part of that generation post-apartheid where those labels still exist, where people who are black are seen as Africans who don't have as much of a mixture. People who are colored are people who are the result of the mixture that took place between the indigenous black Africans, the white settlers, and also other people of color who moved into that area. And then people who are white are still, you know, just white. So why I'm bringing this up is that those who tried to um, criticize Tyla for identifying herself as colored didn't take the time out to understand the context of the culture that she came out of. So in other words, they were loud and wrong because they assume that the way that we as black Americans view race carried over worldwide. So these are just two examples of by not having a global perspective and assuming that our American perspective was dominant, that people inadvertently, you know, made fools out of themselves and created conflicts when there weren't really conflicts. So these are both stories that remind us of the importance of cultural competency, the importance of understanding that people do think differently than we do, you know, and not associating negative judgments to people for thinking that way, but actually seeking to understand that difference. And this is important because as I've said, in the Great Commission, we are commanded to teach all nations and not just those who think just like we do. That means we've got to get to know people and understand how they think and why they think the way they do so that we can best present the gospel in a way that it makes sense for them, okay? And we can't teach people who we are not at peace with, all right? So this brings me to my conclusion, which is this. I want to add a few additional ideas as we conclude. One is this. Sometimes we don't need to look too far for um, the need for peace because the need for peace exists within our own families. So oftentimes disputes in families can go on for generations and they are often petty. And no, I'm not talking about things that are serious that are related to like crime or abuse. Because in those cases, you know, creating distance really is the answer. 
But more often than not, the conflicts that exist in families are very petty and they only persist because of our own stubbornness. You know, like I've heard stories, people like I have been mad at you because of something you did, like you made fun of me when we were children. And then you have you find out these are people who are like in their 70s who are still angry with one another because one person, I don't know, maybe took the other one's doll. Or one person maybe, you know, had a friend group that didn't include the other. You know, I'm saying that you can hear things like, wow, you've been mad at this person for like longer than I've been alive. And I'm not incredibly young anymore. You know, some of you can relate to that. Like, you know, it's like, you know, I don't even think, have you been in a situation where like, you try to find out why people don't like each other and you realize they've been holding this grudge for so long, they don't even know why they don't like each other anymore? Like, it happened in, like, 1957, but they can't even remember what happened in 1957 just that they don't like each other? All I'm going to say is this. Don't let stubbornness get in the way of our pursuit of peace with those who are closest to us. All right? And... The other thing I want to make sure we remember as we talk about this pursuit of peace, you know, and yes, it's true, again, that we have to focus on pursuing peace with those who don't look like us, those who don't act like us, and those who don't think like us. But we also have to be careful not to get discouraged when our efforts to bring about peace aren't really supported right away. I mean, keep in mind that peace in and of itself is a foreign concept to people who have known nothing but war. And I say this in acknowledging that we are a church that is largely made up of the descendants of enslaved Africans. Trauma is in our DNA, literally. And our people have known nothing but struggle and war for as long as we have been in this country. And we of all people understand what it's like to never feel completely safe and at peace in this society. A lot of times we do feel like we're being targeted. But here's the thing, the pursuit of peace requires vulnerability and unfortunately, that concept of vulnerability makes a lot of us uncomfortable, especially when for us, as the descendants of enslaved Africans in particular, the survival of our people often required our ancestors to be invulnerable. So I want to say this. When you are a peacemaker, your pursuit of peace may upset some people. But it's not always that it's upsetting people because they have a vested interest in maintaining the conflict and maintaining the division, though there are some who do, sometimes it's just that in their own experience, peace doesn't last too long. In their own experience, peace is only there when someone is trying to get something from them. In their own experience, this is just a calm before the storm, and some people are always bracing up for the next storm. So just in your pursuit of peace, have patience for the people who have been through war. Have patience for the people who are still processing their experiences from what they've been through. And don't take it personally and don't let that convince you not to pursue peace because the pursuit of peace is what God wants from us. As this passage makes it clear, as the author made clear in this passage to us, well, to um, the believers at that time and to us by extension, um, we do know, we do believe as Christians that there is going to come a time that Jesus is coming back. But we aren't supposed to just wait for him to come back and do nothing in this world. We are supposed to make sure that the way that we interact with those in our environment is in such a manner that when Jesus comes back, he will find us in peace. That means that everywhere we go, we are making peace and not sowing discord. Everywhere we go, we are bridging gaps and not strengthening divisions. Everywhere we go, we are acting in God's agape love and not trying to sow discord so that we can have power that way. So let's just make sure that we truly are the embodiment of what God has called us to be and that we bring peace with us, we bring his peace with us that surpasses all understanding wherever we go. That way, 
whenever Jesus comes back, he will see his peace. God bless you all. So I am going to um, put up the contact card again. And I am glad to um, see you all again. I'm going to take a sip of tea and then we are going to open the doors of the church and then I'm going to close out. All right. So. Some of you may be wondering, you know, this this sermon today was about the importance of pursuing peace. You know, we are in this season of Advent with peace being the focus of the second Sunday. And during this time period, we are celebrating the arrival of Jesus and his eventual return. But this may seem, you know, a bit abstract and distant from you because you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus. See, for us, you know, Jesus return in a lot of ways be like a reunion, you know, because we believe he's been here before and we are his people. We are the descendants of the people that he left behind in order to create this lovely organization that we know of as the church. But you may not know where you fit into that. Well, I'm going to offer you today the opportunity to um, become a believer, meaning one who knows Jesus for yourself, one who understands what Jesus did for us, and one who has a personal relationship with him as a result of that. See, we believe as Christians or as believers, as I call us, that Jesus is the son of God, who's God in the flesh, who came down and died for our sins and has now been resurrected. And what he did is important because his sacrifice makes it possible for us to have personal relationships with God, just as God wanted us to have from the beginning of time. So, if you would like to begin this journey as a believer today so that you can find out what God has for you and what direction God wants you to take in your life, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If you pray that prayer with me today, congratulations, you're now safe. We'd love to hear from you. Um, you can put it in your contact card. You can message us. You can write it in the comments and we'll pray with you and hear back from me or from our first lady, from our deacon to help you figure out your next steps in your journey as a believer. Or maybe you are somebody who already identifies as a believer, but you are in need or in search of a community to be a part of. You know, we would love to have you here as a part of Pivot Point Gathering. We have a great mandate that God has given us, you know, to um, break barriers and build bridges. We just would love to have you to be a part of us. And we want to make it clear that, you know, we have a category of associate membership, which is for those who are a part of other churches, but still identify strongly with what we do here. And I'm only bringing this up not because our associate members are less than in any way, but because maybe you do identify strongly with what we do in this place, but you have a church that you love. You know, if that's you, we'd also like to hear from you. Or maybe you're somebody who's in need of prayer. Thankfully, um, we are a church that believes in the power of prayer. And so we have a lot of you who've been putting your prayer requests in the comments already. You can also submit your prayer requests um, through the contact card. You can submit your prayer requests um, as a direct message. And you'll hear back from, well, you will hear back from me, obviously. But if you put your prayer requests in the comments while we're live, we will pray over your prayer requests right now. Or you can just submit them over you know throughout the week you can put them through our facebook and instagram stories and we will pray over your prayer request during the week we're thankful for those of you who submit your prayer requests and for those of you who share your, your prayer requests and lastly if you'd like some more information we are going to get our mailing list together definitely for january so you know we'd love to hear from you all right with that i am going to take another sip of tea but before I do that, I want to say something that I always say, well, aside from thank you all, you know, it really is a privilege to serve you all in this capacity. Um, and it's especially a privilege because this is my last Sunday before my 40th birthday. So this is the last Sunday of my 30s. And 
you know, this is a pretty reflective time for me with my birthday coming up. But I just want to say thank you all. Thank you all for trusting me to serve in this role. Thank you all. Even if I'm not your pastor and you just watch from time to time, thank you all. I really appreciate this. Um, you know, it's a real privilege to be used by God in this way. I don't take it lightly. Um, and I thank you all for your support of this ministry. You know, there are a lot of other places you could be right now. There are a lot of other ministers you could watch right now. You know, but I'm thankful that you're spending this time here with us today. And I'm going to say something I say every week, which is this. It is sad to me that there are people who can go through the whole week without hearing somebody say, I love you. So on behalf of the Pivot Point Gathering family, we love you. God loves you. You're important. You matter. And if we were in service today in one building, I would do what my father in the ministry did every Sunday which would be, I would say, God loves you. And then the rest of the church would say, and so do we. So now don't worry. You know, nobody who has listened to this service can say, nobody said, I love you to me this week because you've gotten it. So receive it and know that you are important to us. All right. So with that, we are going to close out, but I always have my eyes open a little bit during service. I mean, during the prayer to make sure that, um, yeah, to make sure that I don't miss any prayer requests as they come through. But I'm thankful to you all, and I will continue to pray for you, continue to pray for me, and I hope to see a bunch of you at my birthday celebration on Saturday. But if not, you know, I still love you either way, all right? <laughs> so with this, we're going to close out. Let me just take a sip of tea. All right. Let us, well, let me put the prayer requests back up so you can see them. Now, let us pray. Um, Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. And we thank you for the reminder that the pursuit of peace is challenging, but it is what you require of us. So right now, we just pray that you would have your way in our lives. Continue to get the glory of what we, out of what we do. And everybody know you pray you would help us to just apply today's message to our lives. Remind us of the power that comes with your peace. Remind us of the importance that it is, of how important it is for us to pursue peace with all those in our environment. That way we will have a better chance at spreading your gospel. And also remind us that, um, you know, difference and division are a part of life, but that we still, even when we disagree, we can still be good neighbors. We can still be kind citizens. We can still show your love, even the people who don't believe you exist. That doesn't mean we don't love them. It doesn't mean we don't respect them. Just help us to show your love even when people may make it difficult and help us to be better examples of your love as we strive to spread your gospel and as we strive to be found by you in peace when you come back. But right now, we pray on behalf of all those who've put their prayer requests through the comments. Well, we're going to get to those individually, but those who put their prayer requests through our Facebook or Instagram stories, those who send prayer requests through their contact card, those whose prayer requests remain on their hearts. Just show yourself in our lives and act on our behalf in such a way that there will be no other explanation but your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And right now we pray about the prayer requests that we lift up every week, our location, our capacity, the violence in our streets, the health of those in our community, our nation's infrastructure, our bereaved families, our political system, and the conflict that's happening in Israel. Um, we also uh, ask you to watch over just all the prayer requests. Um, we thank you that people were, well, we ask you to watch over all those who were willing to share prayer requests. We thank you that they were willing to put their stories out there and for the love that exists in this um, fellowship. But right now we pray for Uncle William, Deaconess Julia, Evangelist Tyra, Reverend Simone, Reverend Janita, Miss Jeanette, uh, my father, 
um, Ranisha and Sister Jerry Simpson. You know the needs and all those stories. And we pray that you will intervene in a way that makes it clear that you love and care for all those people. We also ask a special prayer for Sister Victoria. You know her need. And we pray for Sylvia and Jordan. You know the needs in that situation too. And we just thank you for all that you've done and all you will continue to do. And we pray as well for the friend that reached out to me this week asking for prayer. Um, we pray that you would bless her and keep her and all she's going through and let her know that she's not alone and that she serves as an example for many as she is going through what she's going through. But right now, we just pray that you would be with us, show yourself in our lives, and help us to be better examples for you. We also pray you would take care of any concerns that we may have and give us the patience to, you know, be the examples that you have called us to be. And also raise up the support that we need. We thank you for the beautiful organization that is the church that can act as the support that we need as we do our best to represent you where it is you have placed us. But now as we leave this place and go back to our respective destinations, we pray that your angels would encamp around about us, keep us in all of our ways, lest we dash our foot against a stone. And we pray that your light will shine through us and people come to know more about you as they interact with us. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all, and God willing, we'll see you next week.